All right, very familiar portion of scripture here, beginning of Genesis. Most people, um, you know, most Christians haven't read their Bible even cover to cover one time. I, I believe that to be true. It's an unfortunately sad fact. But the book of Genesis, you know, people get this desire to, to read, the, book, read the, the whole Bible cover to cover. They at least get through Genesis. So Genesis is probably one of the most widely read books of the Bible just for that very reason. And of course, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, the sin, and everything that happened as a result, very familiar. And what I'm going to be preaching on this morning is what we just read here. This story exemplifies it perfectly. And the title of my sermon is called The Blame Game. The Blame Game. And we see that game being played out with Adam and Eve in the garden. Of course, just a, just a recap and a synopsis of this book, of this chapter, we have Adam and Eve in the garden. God tells them, you know what? Of all the trees in the garden, you've got free reign. Go ahead and eat. Gives them lots of liberty, right? Eat out of any tree that you'd like, except for this one. There's one tree that I don't want you to eat from. And as a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, I don't want you to eat of that tree. That's it. That was their rule. That was their commandment. And, and the whole garden, they, they just, just follow this one rule. And of course, they couldn't follow it. But we have Satan then tempting Eve. And he questions God's words. He says, yea, hath God said that you shall not eat of every tree? You know, did, didn't he say that? Didn't you say you could eat of everything? Just challenging her. How, how well do you know what God said? And then she's like, well, yeah, we can eat except, except for that one, you know. And then, and then he convinces her, well, you know, you're not surely going to die. And Satan comes and, and just completely refutes God's word and, and says the opposite of God's word and, and just contradicts God's word and starts to cause confusion and doubt into her mind, right? And then what does she do? She looks at it and she's like, wow, actually, it, it, is, it does look like a pretty good tree. The fruit looks pretty good. I think I will give it a try. And then takes that, that tree, the fruit and eats of it, right? And then, of course, Adam, after she eats of it, she brings it to her husband and he eats of it. And, and that's their sin. And, and what's interesting, though, is the very first thing that happens after their sin is, you know, they're hiding from God and God's calling out, saying, hey, where are you? And then, and then they come out and you see, when he finds them and, and uh, you know, he's like, well, what do you mean you're naked? You know, they say, well, we're naked. We had, we had to hide ourselves. We had to clothe ourselves. He says, how did you know you're naked? Did you eat of the tree? And that's when the blame game starts. Yep. That's when the excuses come out. Now, God's rules are very simple. Obviously, this one in particular is very simple. There's a tree. Don't eat of it. Yeah, but what if I'm hungry? Don't eat of it. You've got all these other trees. Don't eat of that one. Very simple. There's, not, there's, no, there's no extra, you know, so, so, there's no um, situations or, or you know, something that's going to come up that's going to make that somehow okay. There's no way to justify eating of that because he just said, don't do it. No excuses. But they did it. You know, Eve was deceived. So, she, you know, Adam, Adam's like, well, hey, and look at this. Look down at, what, at what, um, what Adam says here. Verse, let's start reading again in verse number 11. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did. So, you know, and look, look what he says too. The woman whom thou gavest to me. Like somehow it's God's fault, right? right? Adam sinned. Adam ate the, of the tree that he knew he shouldn't have eaten the fruit of. And he's like, well, wait a minute. Wait, wait. You know, the woman that you gave me, God, that's the reason why I ate. You know, she gave it to me and I did eat. Right? Or just, just not willing to say, sorry, Lord, I ate and I shouldn't have. He says, well, you know, I wouldn't have done it. because he And think about it. He didn't go and pull the fruit off the tree and eat it, did he? He did eat when his wife gave it to him. So that's where in his mind he's already thinking like, well, I, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for her. And throwing the blame up. And, well, hey, you gave her to me, God. You made her. And then he turns to the woman. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Verse 13. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Well, it was him. He, he told me to do it. The devil told me to do it. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because, that, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above 
Every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, and on and on. And then he goes and brings curses upon everyone. Everyone's involved, everyone's culpable, everyone gets a curse. So we have to establish the facts here. The facts are it wasn't right for the serpent to deceive Eve. That was sinful. That was wrong. That's what Satan does, right? But just because someone else does something wrong doesn't make it okay for you to break God's commands. But see, that's what he wanted. She, she cast it. She said, well, he deceived me. Well, he shouldn't have deceived you. That's why he got cursed. Satan didn't eat of the fruit. You know, he, he just convinced Eve to do it. Well, Satan got cursed. Eve already knew God's word. She shouldn't have been. She, knew, she even answered with the right answer. When Satan approached her, he said, well, you know, we're not supposed to eat of any. And she still then ended up looking on it then and lusting after it because she was enticed, because Satan talked her into it. But she's still fully responsible. And see, we need to be careful in our life that we don't start making excuses and justifications and being more focused on blaming other people for our own sins than just owning it and taking responsibility and just saying, yep, I did it. I shouldn't have done it. I was wrong and I'm sorry. And we're going to see this perfectly played out. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 13. This example with Adam and Eve is the perfect example of just how people work. I mean, the very first thing, after sin, you want to you wanna just minimize your involvement in that sin, right? You get involved in something bad. You get involved in something. You just want to minimize, well, it wasn't really that bad because everybody else, because of him, because of her, because of the devil, and downplay your own decision-making in the process. Eve had a decision to make. Someone confronted her and forced a choice. What are you going to do? Do what God said or do what someone else says? Do what the serpent says. She made a bad choice. She chose wrong. I mean, obviously, the right choice is always going with what God said. She's fully responsible for that. Now, again, Satan gets punished. You know, the serpent gets punished because of their involvement. But that doesn't even lessen or minimize the, the judgment that comes against Eve because she's fully responsible just as much as Adam is. Just because the woman brings it to you, he didn't have to walk over the tree and grab it himself to be fully responsible. He knew just as much as she did what God said. That you don't take of this, you don't, you don't eat of this tree in the midst of the garden. You don't eat it. And he did it anyways. So, we need to combat this, this sinful nature. And this is, the, I mean, this is part of their sinful nature. Just after their first sin, what was in their sinful nature to do then? After that point, deny it, minimize it, and blame someone else. And see, God hates this attitude. And we're going to see that King Saul, the first king of Israel, had this attitude really bad. He was not able to accept the things that he did that were sinful. The, the key differences between Saul and King David, because both of them sinned grievous sins. Both of them sinned really bad, in, in, in many very bad ways. But see, I would think that David, in a sense, was even worse, at least er, compared to earlier on in Saul's life. When Saul got the kingdom removed from him, the things that Saul did, I don't think were quite as grievous as committing adultery and murder. Okay? Yet Saul had the kingdom ripped away from him and David didn't, even though he sinned. And the reason why was because of his heart and because of his attitude and because he repented, because he got right with God and, and, it, and, it, and it affected him. And he, was, he actually cared about being right with God more than about the way that he looked in front of other people. And more than about trying to lift up himself and try to make himself seem better than he actually was. We're going, to read, we're going to try to learn a lot from King Saul this morning. So if you, hopefully you're in 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel 13, we're going to see 
King Saul's first big mistake. First Samuel 13. We'll start reading in verse number five. First Samuel 13, verse number five. The Bible reads, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth Avon. So we're starting to read here just to give you, you know, the, the Philistines and Israel had a lot of fights, especially at this time, back and forth. And the Philistines were keeping Israel under bondage until King Saul was, was kind of lifted up to be a leader there. And uh, they were causing a lot of problems. And we see here 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horses. There's a great multitude. And the people at the time in this story, I don't think I have it in my notes, but it's in this story, they didn't even have weapons. The only people who even had a sword were King Saul and his son Jonathan. Everyone else had like farm tools and whatever they could find, whatever they could whip up to try to create some type of a weapon out of. They used those as their weapons of war, not real weapons of war, swords and spears and, you know, and, and, and bows and arrows and things like that. They had to just use, make do with what they had. So they're being faced by a, 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 a big enemy, right? They've got chariots. They've got horsemen. I mean, they are prepared for battle. So ju just to put yourself in the mindset, because when we, when we look at these people, we want the full reality of the situation. It's easy to sit on our high horse and judge everyone else and why, oh, they're so bad and they're so wrong and everything else. But I want you to put yourself in their situation because that is the most important thing to do is to see things from their perspective and then realize still that what they did was wrong. And it was still wicked and still sinful because it makes it more real because what we do, when we do things that are really stupid and wrong and sinful, We've always got a reason as to why it's okay. Saul has a reason why he does things. But we have to look at what God thinks because God thinks that there is no reason for it. And that's the bottom line. When you get into sin, there is no reason for it that is acceptable to God. Amen. Sin is sin. It's against what God said to do. And there is no justification. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter who's talking to you. It doesn't matter what other people say, what other people do. It doesn't matter how you were brought up. What matters is what God says and what you decide to do. Look at verse number six here in 1 Samuel 13. It says, When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, and a strait is a real narrow path. They didn't, they didn't have anywhere to go. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. So they're finding anywhere they can to just hide from this, this massive army because they were outnumbered. They were scared. They didn't know what to do. These are the people that King Saul is trying to lead into battle. They're trying to lead to get victory over the Philistines and they're all hiding. Okay? So again, put yourself in this position. These people are all hiding. They're all scared. They don't know what to do. And he's supposed to be leading them to fight. Verse number seven. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. So some of the people left. They fled. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Not a good position to be in if you're leading a battle and your soldiers are all shaking behind you. They're all quivering. They're all scared. Verse eight. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. So remember, Samuel's the man of God. He's the one, he was the last judge. He was judging Israel up until they wanted a king. And they were just like, we want a king, we want a king. So he anointed King Saul. But Samuel's still a man of God. He's still the one kind of helping out and giving direction according to the word of the Lord to King Saul. Samuel says, okay, wait for me for a week, seven days, and I'll be there. So it says here, so Saul waited. Okay, you say, well, he waited. He, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He tarried seven days. According to that time, Samuel appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So he's saying, well, wait, Samuel's not here. He said he was going to be here in a week. He's not here. I got to do something. This is what's going on in his mind. Verse number nine, and Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings 
and he offered the burnt offering. So we see here now King Saul, who was of the tribe of Benjamin, not a Levite, not of, of the priesthood. Samuel was a priest. Samuel is the one, according to the Bible, according to, the God, to God's word, according to the law, is the one, is the only one who's supposed to be offering up these sacrifices, offering up burnt offerings. That was a job given to the Levites, specifically in this case, to the priest. That was his job to do. King Saul usurped that authority because he just said, well, he's not here. This needs to be done. I'm going to step in and do it. And in so do it, you say, yeah, but he was trying to do the right thing. Yeah, but trying to do the right thing doesn't matter when God says it's the wrong thing. God says it's only for the priests. When you go and step over that boundary, it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter what your intent is. It's still a sin. It's still wrong and you're still going to be punished for it. People have a concept these days, and, and, and look, this has gotten out of control. Now look, God does try the hearts. God does judge the heart. Your heart is important to God, but your heart is not an excuse for sin. There are two different things. God doesn't overlook your sins just because you're trying to do what's right. I mean, we could go back to Cain and Abel. You could look at Cain's sacrifice offering versus Abel's sacrifice. Abel brought, brought the, the appropriate sacrifice. He brought the uh, um, a lamb, right, of the flock because that is an acceptable sacrifice to God because there has to be blood shed for the remission of sins. That, that's what God wanted. But what did Cain bring? The works of his own hands. Cain brought the, the fruit of the field and, and the things that he did. He's like, oh, well, here's how I'm going to honor God. Bring my own good works. And that's not what God said he wanted, which is why he was told, hey, this isn't acceptable. Hey, if you do that which is right, it's acceptable. It doesn't even matter. You say, yeah, but he's, he's bringing a gift to God. He's bringing a gift to the Lord. He's doing something. His heart's in the right place. He's trying to serve God. God says, not acceptable. If you really want to serve God, let's do it the way that he said to do it. Let's look at his words. Let's not contradict what he says. And it doesn't matter what the reasoning is. It doesn't matter how your people are scared. It doesn't matter that Samuel didn't show up when he said he was going to show up. Saul, you don't do the sacrifice. Him, he, somehow he thought that the sacrifice was more important than doing it the way that God said. And God says the exact opposite. It's, look, your obedience is way more important to me and just listening and adhering to my word than any offering or any sacrifice or anything that you can give of yourself. I'd rather you just obey what I say. That's God's stance. And that's, that's an important uh, understanding that we need to get home, get, drive home into our heads. Look at verse number 10 here. Verse number 10, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, same came, look at As soon as he made an end. She goes, oh, it's seven days. He's not here. I got to do this. Does the sacrifice, boom, Samuel, show you. If he would have just waited, I mean, just a little bit, like there's just enough time for him to commit that sin before Samuel showed up. As soon as he's done, Samuel's right there. It just took a little bit more patience, a little bit more faith, a little bit more time to just wait. And, you know, and, and look, this is an important lesson to learn too. When things are going bad in your life, when it feels like, oh man, you know, the stress and the pressure and everything, you know, everything's going wrong around me. I just need to step in. I need to do something about this. And you're, but it's, it's making a bad choice or wrong decision. Sometimes you just need to wait it out a little bit longer. The children of Israel were, were complaining about not having water when they were brought out of Egypt. And the Bible says, you know, when, when Moses got water out of the rock, all they had to do was go a little bit further and they would, they made it, they would have made it to the land where there's you know, the full oasis and, and there's, there's water and everything else, they, if they would have just had more faith to push that extra mile, to just go a little bit longer, the, the relief was coming. The relief was coming. Here, Samuel was coming. They just had to, he just had to stick it out a little bit longer. Endure a little bit longer. Verse number uh, 11. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? Samuel's upset. Like, what are you doing? What did you do? 
And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the day. Look, and you didn't come in the days appointed. So what's he doing? He's playing the blame game. Yep. Saul, what did you do? This isn't what God said that you're supposed to do. Well, you know, the people were scattered. They, they all were going away. You didn't come in the days appointed. And the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. And I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Yeah, right. I, for I, I just, I had to do it. I just, I knew I shouldn't have done it. But I forced myself to do it because it had to be done. No, Saul, it didn't. Not by you. It's going to be done by, you know, if, if someone else is failing in there, if Samuel's failing in his area, then that's Samuel's problem he has to deal with God about. But you need to do what's right. If your husband or your wife, they're failing in an area where, you know, between them and God, they're going to need to deal with that. But you need to do what's right. And this is probably one of the biggest areas where people play the blame game is in their relationships. Right? I know brothers and sisters do this all the time. We get this from the kids. And kids, listen up. This is important because they want to give reasons why they did something. Well, well why, why did you hit your brother? Well, because he took my toy. I mean, it's his fault. Why, why did you, you know, why did you throw, why did you destroy their, their artwork? Why did you do this? Well, because they did this to, you know, and, and they're, they're making up excuses and putting blame on other people and they want to excuse why they do something that they know is wrong and they do something that they know is not right for them to do. It's a blame game. And we do the same thing in marriage. Why, why did you, you know, the, the way that we, we treat each other, you know, it, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. I don't want to get too personal. <laughs> There's some things you just don't, you know, it's not appropriate to talk about, right? But it happens to everybody. You get in fights. You get in arguments. You say things that you don't mean. And just because someone may say something to you and they're in the wrong by, by saying those things doesn't mean that you need to retaliate and come back over the top with something even worse. You know, Jesus Christ, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Right? When, when he was shamefully entreated, he suffered it. He allowed it. He let these things come to pass. Hey, that's on you. You know, that's on other people. Don't let other people's sin cause you to then go into more sin. Right. And don't play the blame game. And look, and this has to go, this does have to go to your heart and your attitude of saying, well, I'm right for doing this because you screwed up. No, if you're going against God's word, you're not right for doing that. Let's keep reading here in uh, 1 Samuel 13. Look at verse, because he, he just got done saying, look, I had to force myself to do this. Verse number 13, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. If you, he said, if you would have just done what God wanted you to do, what God told you to do, he would have established your kingdom. It would have been King Saul's line instead of King David's line, right? But he says, you've done foolishly. You didn't listen. When things got tight, when things got tough, you didn't stick to God's word. And this is what God's expecting us to do. Look, times can get tough. And, and, and times have been getting tough. And I mentioned this before, especially in this church, in people's lives. Times get tough. We need to stick with God's word. It's not the time to abandon God and to, and to do things your own way and to take everything in your own hands just because things start going wrong in your life. That's actually the time to stay closer to God's word and do that which is right so that you can make it through the trials and you can come forth shining like gold. And God will bless you for that. Saul would have been blessed. He just had to hold out a little bit longer. And he would have been blessed. His whole, you know, his whole line would have been blessed. But instead, he crumbled, he buckled under the pressure, and he did something that he knew was wrong. He knew he shouldn't have done it, and he did it anyways. And he made justification in his own mind for doing it. Because that was not kept. So it was very clear the way God feels about what Saul did, it's, you did not keep the commandment of the Lord. And God is serious about us keeping his commandments. He doesn't accept excuses. Look at, uh, flip if you would to 1 Samuel 15, just two chapters. Chapter 15. We're going to see another example in the life of King Saul. 
Because this is, th this is something that's habitual with King Saul. This isn't a one-off event. This isn't just one time he screwed up. This is a problem he has in his heart where he just thinks that whatever he does is right. And a lot of this has to do, he, when he gets rebuked later, he's told, hey, when you were little in your own eyes, because he was very little, he was very humble. He, you know, when he was chosen to be the king, he was hiding among the stuff. You know, he, he didn't really want to take on this job. He was thinking, well, who am I? You know, I'm the, you know our, my family is the least family and, and Benjamin is the least of the tribes. And he's like, you know, we're the smallest group. Who, who am I? I'm not the right person to lead. And he was real humble in his own eyes. But after he became king, that all changed. Now he's thinking, I can do no wrong. I'm in this position now and I'm doing, you know, whatever I do is right. And that's not the case. You know, and kings throughout history have had this, this mentality of saying, well, I'm, I'm the Lord's king on earth and everything I do is right. And look, well, anyone who has a position of authority or power can fall into this trap, yep. even at the home. Now, now listen up, husbands, because we, you know, we know full well, and I preach on this quite a bit here because it's so important in this day and age with, with everything being turned on its head when it comes to authority structure, when it comes to, you know, the husband being the head of the household and the wife being in submission, it's completely turned on its head in today's society. It, I mean, the devil is just attacking that and attacking that and attacking that and everything's backwards. But look, I want to warn you too, you know, husbands don't have this mentality that everything you do is always right. Now you may be an authority and your wife should listen to you, but it doesn't mean that you're always right. And everything you do is always right 100% of the time. We know that that's not true. We need to stay humble and we need to lead humbly. But this is a perfect example, example though of a blame game where the wife might say, well, he's wrong. So I'm going to disobey what he said and do whatever it is I want to do anyways. And that is wickedness. Because, uh, you know, like, when the Bible says, like in Ephesians chapter 5, that the, that the wife is supposed to submit to, to their husband just as the church is in submission unto, unto Jesus Christ, as much as Jesus is the head of the church, that's the way that the, the husband is the head of the household, the head of the wife, that you're to obey in everything. That's a commandment from the Lord. That's a commandment from the Bible that says to obey. And when you deliberately disobey, you're going against God's word. And it doesn't matter if you say, well, he's wrong. It doesn't matter. What he said to do isn't right. Now, if it's contradicting God's word, you've got to obey God. But if it's something else, if you're just like, well, my husband doesn't understand this certain situation with whatever, you know, whatever's going on at home and he's telling me to do something. Look, if, you're not, if it's not breaking God's commandments, you need to listen to it, whether he's right or wrong. And men, you need to understand, you're not always right. Now, you do have the authority, but you're not always right. And the way that you lead can, the, the way that your, your heart is, and the way that your attitude is, will affect the way that you lead at, in the home and the way that you're the head of the household. When you're just always thinking, you're, you, if you have this arrogant attitude, you're just always right and, and you're superior, you're not going to be leading well at all. That's going to cause problems in the home. You lead humbly while maintaining that authority but don't, you know, don't get this attitude where everything that you do is righteous all the time. And this is what King Saul had. He had this, this attitude of just saying like, well, you know, I'm, I've got to do it. I forced myself to do this. Well, the priest isn't here, so I'm going to take the priest spot. You know, no, that's not what God said is for you to do. That, this is so, and think about how silly this would be. This would be like, you know, me going to someone else's wife and saying, well, your husband isn't here, so I'm going to correct this wrong. Like, what? <laughs> you don't have authority over someone else's wife. You know, you, you, it's easy to see how ridiculous that would be, but that's, how, that's, that's literally how it was with Saul. It's a very similar situation where that wasn't his role at all to, be, to have the priest's job, yet he just decided to step in, overstep his boundaries, and just totally get into matters that, that is not his business at all. And that has to do with getting lifted up and thinking that you should be more involved than you, than you should be in these, in these matters. Well, let's keep reading here. Uh, first, first Samuel 15, uh, look at verse number one. The Bible says, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, is there anything unclear about this commandment? No. What does he want him to do? Destroy everything. Everything. I mean, he even spells out like, I mean, man, woman, boy, like everything. The, 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 the ox, the sheep, the camels, the ass. That is just, okay, God's serious about this. Judgment is coming down upon the Amalekites from God, from what they did in the past. God's bringing judgment on them. This is what we're supposed to do. Very clear. Samuel giving Saul the word of the Lord of what his instructions are to do. Let's see what Saul does. Look at verse number seven. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now look at, he left one person alive and killed all the rest. So in this regard, he kept 99.9% .9 of what he was supposed to do, right? There's only one person. Everyone else was killed, but one person's alive. Did he obey God's command? No. And, and this can be tough to swallow sometimes. You, we have this attitude of thinking like, well, look, I did all of this right. But if you don't do it completely right, then you didn't do it. You can't say that you, that you obeyed. You can't say that you followed. And King Saul, though, has this attitude of, well, I did it. And let's keep, let's keep reading here. Let's see what he says. Verse number nine. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and, and it wasn't just this one person, so you're going to see this here too, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, which is what they were told to do, utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So the bad one, you know, the bad sheep, the bad flock, the bad goats, they, they, they got rid of those, right? If they were lame or sick or disease, you know, whatever, whatever problem was, the vile, the refuse, sure, we'll utterly destroy all that. But the spoil, the, you know, the good stuff, and we're not going to destroy that. And here's their justification, because look, there's a justification for it. They couldn't just say, well, we just want this stuff and we're completely going to disobey God. So they had to figure out a way to where they can still get this stuff and try to justify it in their own minds. Look at verse number 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So God's saying, you know what? I I'm already upset that I even made Saul the king because he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Verse number 12. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He sees Samuel, hey, hey, preacher. God bless you, man. I did everything God told me to do. It's like, what is going on in his mind? Are you kidding me? God told you to destroy everything utterly. And look at, look at Samuel. Samuel gets angry. Look at what he says here in verse 14. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Oh, he's like, oh, you did everything? Then how, what are these animals that I hear? Why can I hear these sheep and these oxen? You were told to destroy everything. Verse 15, and here's the justification. Here's his reasoning behind. Well, you don't understand. I know that's what God said to do, but, but you don't understand my situation. Here's what we're really trying to do. Verse number uh, 15, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people, and he's not saying him, the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Oh, see, it's, it's all for God. We didn't listen to God because we're giving God a present. It's all for the Lord. Yeah, except you know what? When, when the children of Israel would sacrifice unto the Lord, in almost every case, you know what they did? They also partook of it. They would eat it. 
So they'd bring in their sacrifice and then they would get to eat and everything else. So, you know, first of all, don't, don't just be deceived and think, oh, it's all for God. Yeah, then why did you destroy the bad ones and keep all the good, all the best of it? You know, as, as oh, we're bringing God the best. That's not what God said he wanted. He wanted them destroyed. If, if I tell my children or if I tell someone in my house, hey, go destroy this, and then they bring it back to me or bring back part of it to me, I'm like, what are you doing? I told you to get rid of it all. I don't want it all. It's, it's, you know, it all needs to be done away with. And that's what they're trying to do. God, oh, look, God, God, God says, get rid of this stuff, and then they bring it to him. Yet they still think they're doing, they're doing God's work. Verse 16, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Stay on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? This is where he explained to him, Look, you were, you were humble. You were little in your own eyes. And that's when God lifted you up. Verse 18, And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Now look, you might say, well, what's the big deal? He kept some animals alive and the king. Is that really such a big deal? I mean, is God really going to be upset about that? Absolutely, because God said not to do it. And, and look, don't get this mentality of thinking that, well, is that really a big deal? You know, people say today, does, does God really care about, you know, what I wear? Does God really care about these certain things? Well, if it says it in his Bible, if God says that the man is not supposed to put on a woman's garment, a woman's not to wear that which pertains to a man, then God cares about it. If he says not to do something, he cares about it. If it's not in there at all, then I would say, you know what? No, he probably doesn't care about it. But if he says explicitly, like, don't do this or do this, then he does care about it. So don't fall into this trap of thinking of, well, God, does God even really care about this? Well, God really cared about keeping animals alive. Why is that a big deal? It doesn't matter why. Now, there is a reason why, but it doesn't even matter if you understand what the reason why is. If God said something, we just need to do it. So he says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did bad. He did wickedly. But look at Saul's attitude. And this says a lot. And this, is, this gets to the heart of the matter. And this is ultimately what I'm preaching about this morning is about our hearts. Because when you're confronted, Saul is just confronted saying, you didn't obey the voice of the Lord. And that was literally straight from God. Samuel was speaking for God in this sense. And he was giving him the message from God and saying, look, I told you to do what's right. I told you to, to destroy him utterly and you didn't do it. You're wrong. And we're going to have times when we're faced with areas where we're wrong about something. We're wrong according to God's word. But the way that you deal with that means everything. Because you can still receive mercy. Yeah, you may be chastened. You may be punished for doing wrong. But you can receive mercy when you get your heart right, when you repent, as King David did. But look at Saul's attitude. Look at verse number 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. So now, instead of humbly accepting what you're doing, no, I did do what's right. He just fights it and, and argues with Samuel. Yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Look at verse 21, but the people. I did what was right, but they, blame game. They're, they're the ones, the people took of the spoil. They took the sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. They did it, they brought it, and it's to sacrifice to the Lord your God, right? Right? It's your God. They're trying to sacrifice to your God, right? But you're in charge, Saul. You're leading the people. Don't blame them. Ultimately, and, and with leadership, you know, the, the responsibility falls on the leader. You can't go further up the chain than, than to the top. 
When you're leading people, you're responsible for their actions to a certain degree. And King Saul was definitely responsible for these people. You know, he could have easily said, no, we're utterly destroying them all. And they would have done it. And if, they, and if he would have commanded it, and then they still refused him, then they would have been in rebellion and God would have blamed them and not the leader. If Paul was, Saul, excuse me, Saul was just keeping doing what was right and just doing his best to make sure God's word was being enforced, but, but people still just completely rebelled, then it wouldn't be on Saul anymore. But look at what, what Samuel then says in verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And, you know, just as a side note, this isn't necessarily the blame game, but just keep that in mind. You know, God wants us to obey him. That's what makes him, God most happy. You know, we pass the plate around. You can put in, you know, $1,000 or $5,000 or whatever, you know, and that's not going to impress God nearly as much as you just listening to what he said and doing what he said. You know, it may be a big sacrifice. You may sell all that you have and lay it at the apostles' feet, right? As it were, like in the book of Acts. You may say, you know, I'm making this great sacrifice in my life to give unto the Lord. But if you're living in sin, that's going to mean nothing to God. If you just got some grievous sin and you're, you're just going to bring in your, your big sacrifice, God doesn't care about that. God doesn't have respect under that. God has respect to you listening to him. He wants you just to obey. He's like, just listen to me. You don't have to do all of this stuff for me. Just listen to me. Amen. You don't have to bring all these sacrifices and bring all the best of your fruit of your, of your land or of your hands or whatever. Just obey me. That's what makes God happy. I don't expect my kids to go out and to get jobs and to, and to bring me, you know, I'm not going to be as pleased with them do, you know, working their best. Here, Dad, look, we're, we're, we're bring, you know, I've got $100 for you. I earned all this money for you, and this is all just for you. It's a gift for you. I'd much rather them just be obedient children and doing, you know, because I'm teaching them and guiding them and trying to instruct them the right from wrong. I'd be way happier. I mean, hey, how cool would it be to get a, a cash gift, right? That's, that, that would be nice, but it's way more meaningful and way more important that they just listen and do what I'm instructing them to do. And that's the way that God, our Father, is with us. Like it's way more important that we just get his instruction than we offer up some great present to him. Let's keep reading here, verse number 24. Excuse me, verse number 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Even though he kept, you know, in a sense, a, a, a portion of it, or maybe a large portion of it, Samuel says, you still rejected the word of the Lord because he didn't keep it fully. Verse number 24, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So we see here a partial change of heart, but even still, it's not a full change of heart with Saul. He says, pardon my sin, which is right. He should be saying that. But then he's saying, well, and turn again with me. To come back with me. And, and you might not understand what he's getting at here. We're going we're gonna to get a little bit clearer as we keep reading. What does he mean by turn again with him? He still wants to be held in honor in front of the people. He doesn't want everyone else to know how bad he screwed up. He wants people still to look up to him and still receive that honor from him. He cares more still about what they think. They cared about what they think, which is why he got into sin in the first place. And he continues to have that heart of not just fully giving himself over to being repentant to the Lord. Look at verse number um, 28. Or 27, and Samuel turned about to go away, and he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, this is the key, verse 30, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Yeah, I've sinned, but honor me now. No, Saul, you don't deserve honor. Because you've sinned. 
Don't be go looking for honor now after you've sinned against the Lord and you caused all these problems and you've rejected the word of the Lord. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people. Those are the people that you were trying to please and that got you into sin because you were blaming them and now you still want to be held in honor before them? You see how this blame game works? Oh, they did it, but I still want to look good in their eyes. Saul disobeyed the Lord. He cared about the people in his position even more. And even when he admitted he sinned, he still cared about being honored before the people instead of being truly repentant. Now apply this to today, right? Because you you're not a king. You're not going off to battle. You're not offering up sacrifices. Right? You're, you're not in the exact same position that Saul's in. But we can still apply this to us today. I mean, th think about maybe you're at work. And some of the people ask you to do something sinful, something that you know is wrong, to blaspheme the Lord or partake in some, you know, some filthy jokes or whatever, right? I mean, or, or ask you, you know, telling you to steal something. Hey, it's okay. You know, like we've all done it. We, you know, it's, it, don't worry. You're not going to get caught. No big deal. Whatever it is, causing you not to follow the Lord and to compromise your beliefs, you can't blame them for your actions. And that's what Saul was trying to do. He's trying to blame these other people. No, let's bring these for a gift to the Lord. Compromise. Compromise your faith. He's still held responsible. And you're still held responsible for the decisions that you make. Don't go get involved in this blame game. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and he blamed everyone else. And I'm not going to get into this other story. I kind of ran out of time. But um, he, he even blames his, his followers of not not having sympathy for him, not being sorry for me. Oh, you know, everyone's against me and King David's over here. You know, or he wasn't king at the time. David, you know, David's doing this and you guys, no one's with me, no one loves me. And it's this poor, poor me attitude because he cared about himself and his position. When people get into sin, it's like they're blinded. And you know, we read this about Saul and it's like, how could he be so blind to say that he actually thinks he's obeying the Lord? It's easy to look at someone else but take a look at your own life. Think about things where you've had to say, where maybe you have been confronted and you're thinking that like, oh, well, what I did isn't wrong. And oftentimes you think about areas where, especially you're blaming someone else, you're, you're looking at someone else's sin. Oftentimes, you know, unfortunately, people, people get an attitude and they have the same problem, but they don't want to recognize it in themselves. Think about in your life, are you blaming other people for your own backsliding? Are you getting out of church? Are you skipping out on soul winning? Are you just not doing the things that you know you should be doing and following the commandments of the Lord? What's your excuse? What's your excuse for, for skipping out on church? What's your excuse for not praying? What's your excuse for not reading the Bible? What's your excuse for not going soul winning? Are you, going to blame every, are you going to blame everyone else? Are you going to own up to your own sin and your own actions and just say, you know what? No, I'm responsible. I'm going to take charge in my life and not blame everyone else and blame outside influences. I'm just going to get right with God because God told me to do this. And I'm going to listen to God. And I'm not going to let my family, I'm not going to let my friends, I'm not going to let anyone else deter me from following the Lord completely. I'm not going to blame anyone else. I'm going to do what's right because God said to do it. That's where we need to be. And look, this goes to your heart. Either your heart's going to be right with God or it's not. No amount of preaching, no amount of anyone else telling you what to do is going to change anything if your heart's not right. We ought to be careful who we spend our time with and who we hang out with and things like that. Absolutely, because we want to guard ourselves. We want to take heed. But we need to make sure our heart's right. And we need to make sure that, that we decide not to compromise. And say, I'm just going to do this because it's right. And I'm not going to blame anyone else or let anyone else cause me to fall. Face your problems and take responsibility for your actions because you are ultimately held responsible. Other people might, might get judged for things that they're trying to cause you to compromise or whatever, but at the end of the day, you're still responsible for me. You know, God gave us free will. He gave us a will to decide to do what we're going to do. 
so that you can't blame other people. And don't be surprised when you go off into the world and bad things start to happen to you, by the way. Saul had a lot of judgment come upon him. You know, the Bible says that we reap what we sow. And if you're a child of God, God will discipline you. So don't expect when you start compromising God's word, when things start going bad, don't, don't be surprised at that. Because it is your decision. It is your choice to make. And finally, I just want to close with this because I made that last point. You know, it's not for you to go assuming that someone's not right with God when they are going through hard times. So when someone, you know, again, we have a lot of people who are going through hard times in our church. That doesn't mean that necessarily that they're just not right with God, that they have some secret sin that nobody knows about. Okay? Now, maybe that's the case. But we don't take it upon ourselves to just assume that or apply that to anyone else. Now, if someone's just an open sin, open disregard, and just completely, you know, whatever, caught up into some sin and, and bad things happen, yeah, that probably is a result of that. That is to be expected. But when people are going through hard times, like, like you know, Job's a perfect example of this, where he was righteous. He was doing what was right, but he had all kinds of hard times come upon him. And what happened to his friends who came there to comfort him? They all turned their back on him and said, oh, what is it, Job? You know, God doesn't let these things happen if you're doing what's right. You must have some problem in your life. You must have some sin. Just, just to confess it, Job. Tell, tell us what's wrong. Tell God what, you know, tell God, admit that you're wrong. He wasn't wrong. We don't want to be Job's miserable comforters. These friends that, that you know, when people are going through hard times, it, it, unless we are certain that God is judging them because, yeah, man, they, I mean, Someone gets off into fornication. God's going to judge that. A, a, a born-again believer gets into fornication. You know what? God's going to judge them, and, and I don't have any problems. And yeah, God's probably judging that person if they're getting off into some wicked sin. Yep. But if that's not the case, and you don't know, then, then we need to be supportive and helpful. And, and hey, you know, this is, you know, we, we don't just assume or start thinking, oh, they must, be, they must have done something bad with God. No. We're there to support and to help because we don't know. God knows and God will take care of it and God judges and, and, and it's fine. We can leave that in God's hands, but we need to be there for each other and be supportive, especially if there's someone like Job who's righteous that's, that's having Satan attack him. Hey, you need strength. You need support. And that's, that's what we're here for. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for uh, this clear teachings from the Bible. God, I pray that you please speak to our hearts this morning. Help us to... Um, not put off responsibility for our own actions, God, and that we can face our own problems and just get right and that we wouldn't um, have a stiff neck when it comes to being confronted with our own sins as Saul did. Lord, as King Saul, he, he wasn't able to deal with being wrong. He wasn't able to humble himself in the sight of, of people. Lord, help us to have humility, to be able to not care. Whether, if we're wrong, God, sometimes we just have to admit it and just, and just humble ourselves and and whether that's in front of our family, our spouse, or, or friends, or whoever it may be, Lord, we just need to be able to humble ourselves and get right with you and be able to get back to, to serving you and obeying your commands. God, I pray that you please help give us the wisdom and, and knowledge and instruction to know right from wrong, to know what it is that we need to be doing with our lives. And um, Lord, help us not to get distracted and off course and start blaming other people for our own actions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.